Thank you very much for that gracious introduction. And I would like to express my deep gratitude to the University of Manchester Center for Jewish Studies and the uh, legacy of Fanny Bogdanova, and especially uh, Professor Daniel Langton and um, Jean-Marc Dreyfus uh, for their kind invitation this year to give these lectures. I'm, I'm deeply honored. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is widely viewed as a hero, uh, icon of moral leadership uh, in the Christian world and beyond. There is a general consensus among Christians at all points of the spectrum that Bonhoeffer was a man who lived for his di and died for his religious beliefs, and that Christians who follow in his footsteps are called to be active against the fight against evil wherever they see it. Within Christian tradition and history, Bonhoeffer seems to be the very embodiment of courage to fight against evil, to witness to one's beliefs, to stand with the victims, and this may be why he continues to have a broad appeal among Christians in many different countries and contexts. His statue is carved in stone on the west front of Westminster Abbey as one of 10 Christian martyrs of the 20th century, next to Martin Luther King, Oscar Romero, Maximilian Kolbe, and others. Among Christians, especially in my own country, he is claimed by liberals and evangelicals alike. Uh, but his appeal reaches beyond religious circles because of his unusual life, his undisputed courage, and his per, probably his uh, prison writings. Bonhoeffer has been quoted by op-ed writers, politicians, and people of all faiths and political persuasions, from the late atheist Christopher Hitchens, to President George Bush, to evangelical abortion doctor assassin Paul Hill, to the American Muslim interfaith leader Ibu Patel. He wrote seven major theological works, including two that are internationally acclaimed as Christian spiritual classics, Life Together and Discipleship. The English publication of his prison letters in 1953 brought the story of his life to an international audience. Appearing in the wake of the Holocaust, letters and papers from prison revealed a man of conscience, a provocative and eloquent theologian, a political hero, as his former student and close friend and biographer, Eberhard Bacon later put it, a man for his times. Bonhoeffer is known primarily as a theologian, but the popular interest in him is due, I think, more to his place in history. Primarily his role in the German Confessing Church, which was the anti-Nazi faction within the German Protestant Church, as well as his connections to the German resistance circles that tried to overthrow Adolf Hitler and his execution at the age of 39. Because of his place on the grand stage of 20th century history, he is viewed on a larger than life scale, a rare model of unambiguous faith and courage against the evils of national socialism. The lessons of all this have been predictably filled in by people who admire Bonhoeffer for very different reasons. And Bonhoeffer has become, in my country, the poster boy for a variety of contradictory causes. In the Christian world, especially the what would Bonhoeffer do question is uh, constantly raised by activists on all points of the spectrum. The result, I would argue, is a finished portrait of a hero, prophet, and activist. A picture that I think really lacks the ambiguity the pathos and the uncertainty that was, in fact, one of the more striking characteristics of his all too brief, fragmented, and unfinished life. In the process, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's ascent to mythological hero has obscured the realities of his life story and, I think, even skewed our understandings of some of his writings. By its very nature, hagiography is superficial. And many interpretations of Bonhoeffer's life tend to fulfill the pictures of what a Christian hero should look like, rather than examining the man in depth. In these popular portraits, the threads of his life story, his theological writings, and his actions weave together neatly in an un, a seamless garment. There is a straight and unbroken path leading directly from his childhood to his studies, to his role as pastor and teacher, and eventually into the resistance. His early life writings are linked to the resistance. Bonhoeffer is given a central role in events in which he was in fact a minor figure, a decisive and active uh, role at moments in which his actual behavior was in fact ambivalent. Much of the existing literature on Bonhoeffer has made him the central figure on the historical stage, larger than life and certainly playing a larger role than he actually did in history. Just as importantly, Many of the works on Bonhoeffer written by theologians have bypassed the extensive new scholarship and research that has been on, done on Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. 
In the last 50 years, historians and other scholars have developed a much more critical understanding of key aspects of this history, including the role of ordinary Germans, church leaders, German elites, and the resistance circles in which Bonhoeffer moved. But the Bonhoeffer story has remained largely untouched by this historiography, which raises some questions about the historical reliability of our portrait of Bonhoeffer, and perhaps as a result of our interpretations of his theology. Can we really understand what Bonhoeffer was all about if we don't understand exactly where he stood in history? The question was provocatively raised by the British historian Andrew Chandler in his wonderful 2003 essay, The Quest for the Historical Bonhoeffer, in which he observed that most theologians of most theolo theological interpreters of Bonhoeffer had become what he described as stuck in the historiographical grooves. Chandler was joined by a number of scholars of the Holocaust who have come to view Bonhoeffer's historical role more critically. Observing that popular portraits of Bonhoeffer as a rescuer of Jews rely more on assumption than actual evidence, for example, the historian Kenneth Barnes wrote, in the shadow of the Holocaust, Bonhoeffer's words and actions appear small, tentative, restrained, and ambivalent. The Bonhoeffer phenomenon illustrates that people would rather huddle around one point of light, no matter how feeble and flickering the flame, than sit alone in the darkness. So what are we to make of all this? This evening I'd like to talk about the complexity, not just of Bonhoeffer, but of his times because I think only then can we begin to understand who he was and what significance he has, both theologically and historically. My intent is not to pull Bonhoeffer off a pedestal, but to see whether it is possible to recover a portrait of who he actually might have been during his lifetime. Who was Dietrich Bonhoeffer before he became a Christian hero? How would we understand him if we saw him as a single figure on the historical landscape on which he walked? How would we understand him if we had a better understanding of that landscape, the history of Nazi Germany, the Holocaust, and the complexities faced by Germans of conscience? Would we understand him differently and even read his theolo theology differently if we got the history right? Let's begin with the historical context. Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany in, on, in January 1933, and what followed in the subsequent six weeks is a rather stunning case study in how quickly a society can collapse. Until Hitler abrogated the German constitution on March 23rd, Germany remained a constitutional democracy. His conservative nationalist coalition partners in the government expected that they would be running the government, assuming that the popular new chancellor would be a figurehead who could pull the support of the German people behind the government in a way that the Weimar Republic had never been able to do. But those first six weeks of National Socialism show how quickly the dominoes can fall. Hitler had the popular support of a broad segment of the German population that included many in the German upper classes and not incidentally many leaders of German Protestantism. There was little opposition to the Nazi measures against his opponents on the left, the communists, the liberal parties, etc. Nazi paramilitary groups were given free reign to beat up Jews and other social undesirables. Against all these measures, the cautious conservatives were notably silent. And by March 23rd, when Hitler abrogated the German constitution, it was all over. There were, however, Germans in 1933 who understood very clearly the moral and political significance of what was happening around them. And here, of course, we look to Bonhoeffer and also his brother-in-law, Hans von Donani, a lawyer married to Bonhoeffer's sister, Christine, and someone who profoundly influenced how Bonhoeffer addressed the political realities around him. In the early months of Nazism, young Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was 27 years old, wrote two striking essays that reveal his political insights. One was titled The Führer and the Younger Generation. It began with a section of re reflections on why it was that Germans of Bonhoeffer's generation were so enthusiastic about Hitler and then warning them about what Nazism really meant. The other essay is called The Church and the Jewish Question, written after the passage of the first racial laws in April 1933 and published in June of that year. The Church and the Jewish Question is a very complex text, 
that among other things contains a strongly anti-theological or anti-Jewish theological passage, one of the things that makes Holocaust scholars so critical of Bonhoeffer. In contrast, the essay's central message was the very radical position that the Nazi regime was not a legitimate form of governance. This is April 1933. Because in persecuting the Jewish minority, it wasn't exercising its authority legitimately. Bonhoeffer based his this conclusion in his essay on the Lutheran understandings of authority, but the arguments he made actually echoed some of what could be called civil liberties language that I believe he learned both in the United States at Union Seminary and in his experiences in an African-American church in Harlem, as well as through his role in the European ecumenical movement, and I'll be talking about that more tomorrow evening. In other words, only a few months into 1933, Bonhoeffer became one of a small group of Germans that included his brother-in-law, who were challenging the very moral and political legitimacy of the new Nazi state because of its treatment of the Jews. So the question that now confronted them was, what should they do? To this, there were different answers. There were German dissidents during that spring who were immediately arrested. There were others who went into exile. Throughout the 1930s, one finds a small group of courageous German individuals who resisted Nazism and helped its victims. And I'll name just a few people who are not nearly as well known as they should be and not as well known as Bonhoeffer. Friedrich Sigmund Schulze, was a Protestant pastor who had founded a social welfare center in Eastern Berlin, where he worked with activists of all faiths, including Quakers and Jews. In 1933, he was deported by the Gestapo for his efforts to help German Jews. Elisabeth Schmitz was a secondary school teacher and confessing church member who courageously resigned her position in protest after the November 1938 pogroms writing impassioned letters urging confessing church leaders to speak out and then helping some Jews to hide. Hermann Maas was a remarkable pastor in Heidelberg who befriended the Jewish community there and formed such a strong bond with the local rabbi that when the rabbi had to leave Germany in 1936, Maas actually took over the synagogue services for him and helped the congregation, eventually helping some of their members hide or, or flee Nazi Germany. Another pastor, Julius von Jan, preached a powerful sermon after November 1938, condemning the violence and was beaten by Nazi thugs before being sent to prison. Ludwig Steil, Ernst Film, and Paul Schneider were confessing church pastors whose public denunciations of Nazi policies from the pulpit led to their imprisonment in concentration camps and Steil and Schneider were killed. Bernard Lichtenberg was a Catholic priest in Berlin who prayed publicly on behalf of the Jews and died in a train on the way to Dachau. While little known, these individuals stand out because of their public solidarity with Germany's Jews, a solidarity for which they paid in some cases with their lives. And on this point, Dietrich Bonhoeffer presents an odd contrast. Although certainly sympathetic to the Jews and very critical of the regime, there is little public record of his opposition throughout the 1930s. There is indeed evidence of his engagement behind the scenes, in some cases helping Jews immigrate, in 1935 combating a, German, a church statement that would have supported the Nuremberg Laws, for example. But his most forthright public statements were really focused on the battle for the theological integrity of the confessing church. He opposed the Nazification of the church. He was notably silent and passive after the November 1938 pogroms. And that was a moment when many felt that the public outcry was most needed. Although he was at the forefront of the radical wing of the confessing church during the 1930s, that activism didn't extend, at least not publicly, outside of the church struggle. The same must be said of many of the individuals who eventually found their way into the German resistance, notably the July 20th conspiracy to overthrow the regime. In some cases, these conspirators were people who had started out supporting the regime only to turn against it. In other cases, they were opposed from the beginning, but thought that they could achieve the most from working within. And what this meant throughout the 1930s was that they pursued their careers, chose their battles, and tried to do what they could. And in so doing, even men like Hans von Dunani and Dietrich Bonhoeffer increasingly found themselves in a difficult and murky realm of complexity, ambiguity, and even complicity.
If we look at Hans von Donani and track his career over the course of the 1930s, I think we get a sense of what that must have meant. Donani was a br brilliant rising lawyer with numerous Jewish friends, just beginning his career in the 1930s. He was brought into the justice ministry and soon rose through the ranks, eventually working directly under Franz Gertner, who would be justice minister until his death in 1941. Like many of these people, Gertner has an oddly complicated record. He was trusted by the confessing church. His biographer shows how many instances he opposed what the Nazis were doing. And he personally covered for Donani on a number of occasions. But you don't stay on as justice minister under Adolf Hitler for 10 years without making a number of compromises. In the case of Hans von Donani, we have substantial evidence of his early opposition to Nazism and his attempts to help Jewish colleagues. In the wonderful biography of Donani that was published several years ago by the German scholar Marika Schmidt, there's a recurring question in his letters to his, sister, or to his wife, Christina, throughout the 1930s, is it time for me to get out? There's a haunting picture from 1934 of a group of high-ranking Nazi officials listening to Adolf Hitler speak in the wake of the Rome Putsch, in which Hitler not only wiped out his party rivals, but took it as an opportunity to murder a number of political opponents. There in the back of the picture is Hans von Donani standing against the wall. Donani's father had been raised by a Jewish couple, and Hans von Donani, for that reason, was never able to get an Aryan certificate. Adolf Hitler personally signed the exemption that exempted Donani and his sister Greta, who was married to Karl Friedrich Bonhoeffer, from the racial laws. In Donani's case, there is extensive documentation of his opposition to Nazism and his personal efforts to help Jewish colleagues, and he has been acknowledged by Yad Vashem as a righteous Gentile. But he too was surrounded by colleagues and others who made compromises, who sometimes benefited from the Nazi anti-Jewish measures by obtaining the homes or the jobs of Jews who had been pushed out, people who care calculated carefully when to speak out and when to remain silent. And once the war began, the German resistance circles in which Bonhoeffer found himself were filled with people like this whose lives and records were even messier. One of them was Bonhoeffer's second cousin, Paul von Hase, who was also executed after July 20th. A career military officer, von Hase, rose through the ranks during the 1930s, gave speeches praising Hitler's racial policies, moved with his family into a home that had been taken from a Jewish family, and finally became city commandant of Paris during the German occupation before being promoted to commandant of Berlin. This was the world in which Dietrich Bonhoeffer moved, especially once he became involved in resistance circles. Bonhoeffer's insights into that situation are most evident. In a letter he wrote in December 1942 to Hans von Donani, his friend Eberhard Beitke, and Colonel Hans Oster, a member of the resistance. The letter has come to be known as After 10 Years Reckoning. It's published in the book Letters and Papers from Prison. And it is, to my mind, the best thing he ever wrote. It's a remarkable document, a remarkable reflection on what had happened to Germany and its people after 10 years of National Socialism. <coughs> it's also, I think, a moving personal account of Bonhoeffer's own journey from a critical but privileged position that he had in 1933, a steady move toward <coughs> resistance and conspiracy that eventually placed him among the victims of the regime. The essay contains many of Bonhoeffer's most memorable quotes, but they are often misunderstood, I think, if they are read heroically. I believe, however, that Bonhoeffer wrote this essay in a moment when he was confronting the realities of what had happened, one of which was that many Germans, many good Germans, had failed to step in and stop things much earlier. The networks around the July 20th conspiracy consisted mostly of high-level diplomats, civil servants, professors, political officials, and career military officers, all of whom were critical of the regime and had begun to think very concretely about what a post-Nazi Germany might look like. But the plans to overthrow the regime depended on the few high-ranking officials who had direct access to Adolf Hitler. And of course, the success of their plans rested on a number of other factors that include, included measures to prevent a counter coup against, or by loyalist Nazis and quickly assure popular support. So the generals who were involved in the conspiracy vacillated constantly, sometimes according to how the war was going, sometimes driven by their own opportunism. 
By the end of 1942, when Bonhoeffer wrote this letter, there had been several failed or aborted attempts to assassinate Hitler. That fall, the hopes of the Donati group had risen after the German invasion of the Soviet Union, only to be dashed when the, when the invasion initially seemed to go well, and General von Brauchitsch and others backed away from coup plans. The invasion of the Soviet Union also meant that the genocide that had already begun against the Jews of Europe escalated dramatically. Hans von Donani was receiving constant information and documentation about atrocities and mass killings in the East. When Bonhoeffer wrote his letter in December of 1942, four million European Jews had already been murdered. The conspirators could not know that only a few months after, later, the tide of the war would turn and the German forces would be decimated at Stalingrad. But in December of 1942, there seemed to be no ground beneath their feet, as Bonhoeffer put it, and no signs that the generals were going to attempt another coup, even as the scope of war crimes and atrocities were reaching new levels. And so Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the recipients of his letter, good men who were well aware of the evils of Nazism from the beginning, who were trying to do what they could from where they were, had nonetheless not been able to completely escape being part of what was around them. Indeed, one of the most haunting lessons of this history is, I think, is that when one is caught in the midst of an evil system, one is inevitably touched by the surrounding evil in some fashion or another. In 2015, on the 70th anniversary of Bonhoeffer's death, I published a short essay in the Washington Post in which I described the nature of human evil during National Socialism as being like rising water, leaving nothing untouched, no one untainted or unchanged. Bonhoeffer's sister, Christine von Donani, the widow of Hans von Donani after the war, described a similar process with regard to her husband, where she anguished about what she called the unavoidable complicity uh, of, of his role in the regime, even as he was si seeking to bring it down. For me, the most haunting example comes from Bonhoeffer's weeks in Etol, the Benedictine monastery in the Bavarian Alps. It was the year before he wrote um, After Ten Years. The photographs of Etol are like picture postcards, if you've ever seen them, a monastery tucked among the snow-covered Alps. And his time there has been portrayed as a quiet period of retreat, uh, it, during which he wrote some of his ethics manuscripts, a place where he, Hans von Denani, and Eberhard Beetke were meeting secretly with resistance figures. Yet it turns out that Etal during Bonhoeffer's period there was a busy place. It had taken in civilians from bombed out German cities. Uh, more relevant to my remarks this evening, during Bonhoeffer's time in Etal, there were 59 forced laborers who were working for the monastery in the housekeeping and on the grounds. 35 of them were prisoners of war. 24 of them were civilians whom German soldiers had forcibly brought from Eastern Europe, including a young Polish couple with two small children. As the German army marched across Europe, it not only subjugated local populations, but it brought civilians and prisoners of war back into the Reich for slave labor. Some of them worked in factories, some were put to work in various public projects, and as it turns out, 6,000 of them ended up working in institutions that were run by the churches, including monasteries. They were not paid. These were human beings who had been ripped from their homes, communities, sometimes their families. They had been brought back under horrendous circumstances by German soldiers. By August of 1944, there were over seven and one half million non-German workers registered as forced laborers in the Reich, and 59 of them were in Etal. When I realized this in the course of my research, I went back and began to read the ethics manuscripts, which Bonhoeffer wrote during that period differently. He does not speak explicitly in ethics about slave labor, but he writes about things like the right to bodily life, the right to freedom, and most especially the blurring of lines between good and evil across Germany. And this has led me to reflect differently on the complexity of Bonhoeffer's path. We have on the one hand these remarkable statements in his writings, his early opposition to Nazism, his recognition of its fundamental inhumanity and illegitimacy, and his warning that the church was called in his words to speak out for those who cannot speak. There are other elements of his theological works that resonate in after 10 years. His belief that all sin is social, for example, because it injures other human beings and frays the very fabric 
of human society. His understanding, his Christology, um, as understanding the Christ as the man, who, as he put it, who lives for the other, as the church as existing only if it is existing on behalf of other human beings. And all of these threads begin to come together in this 1942 letter. So let me quote some of the passages from that letter, which may be familiar to you. These are Bonhoeffer's words in his letter after 10 years. One may ask whether there have ever before in human history been people with so little ground beneath their feet, people to whom every available alternative seemed equally intolerable, repugnant, and futile. The great masquerade of evil has played havoc with all our ethical concepts. In recent years, we have seen a great deal of bravery and self-sacrifice, but civil courage hardly anywhere, even amongst ourselves. We must learn to regard people in the light of what they do or fail to do, or not less in the light of what they do or fail to do, and more in the light of what they suffer. We have been silent witnesses of evil deeds. We have been drenched by many storms. Experience has made us suspicious of others and kept us from truth being truthful and open. Intolerable conflicts have worn us down and even made us cynical. Are we still of any use? And finally, there remains an experience of incomparable value. We have for once learned to see the great events of world history from below, from the perspective of the outcast, the suspects, the maltreated, the powerless, the oppressed, the reviled, that is, from the perspective of those who suffer. I would contend that it is at this point in this document, in that last passage, that Dietrich Bonhoeffer had begun to understand what it truly meant to speak from a place of vulnerability and of solidarity. And perhaps that is some of the evidence that he had shifted from being an unfinished hero to someone who understood much more clearly what it meant to be heroic. Bonhoeffer was 35 years old when he wrote that essay. The voice we hear in after 10 years is not that of someone who is certain, hopeful, who thinks that good will ultimately triumph, far less the voice of someone who saw himself in a heroic sense. But I think it's the voice with which victims of injustice often speak. From 1932 to 1933 to 1942, Bonhoeffer had gradually moved from a place of safety to a position of fragile vulnerability. And so his focus became as never before what he and his fellow conspirators might have to offer a broken world. And he wrote, the ultimate question for a responsible man to ask is not how he is to extricate himself heroically from the affair, but how the coming generation is to live. The French philosopher and historian René Girard once coined the term disruptive empathy as a description of the moment in which our empathy with the fate of another human being becomes so genuine, so real, that we are willing to disrupt our lives for it and our own reality. When that happens, we stop living as before. We can no longer act as though the injustice were not taking place or had nothing to do with us. And we become willing to stand with the other person and share their fate. It marks the moment in which the cause of the persecuted, persecuted becomes one's own cause, one's own battle, and that commitment also bears a readiness to bear the consequences. In after 10 years, I think we see a Bonhoeffer whose life has been disrupted. The letter is, among other things, a lengthy critique of the values, class, and world from which he had come. His question, are we still of any use, is the acknowledgment of the failure of that world. And yet even his famous passage about the view from below reveals that he had moved into that world after a period of time. The inevitable tension between Bonhoeffer's approach to the Jewish question in 1933 as a civil rights issue and the privilege of his own position meant that he might never fully grasp what the Nazi years during the 1930s had truly meant to the Jews of Germany. But he went much farther than most and by 1942 I think he had almost gotten there, which I think is one reason why he continues to inspire so many people. At the time he wrote, after 10 years, he was still a free man. He would be arrested several months later in April of 1943. And on July 21st, 1944, 
One day after the failed attempt, the final coup attempt against the Nazis, Bonhoeffer wrote a letter from prison to his friend Eberhard Betke. <coughs> it is clear from the letter that Bonhoeffer was fully aware of what had just happened. The final attempt to overthrow the re Nazi regime had failed and he wasn't going to get out alive. And so he wrote, writes Baker, I'll read an excerpt from his letter. I remember a conversation I had 13 years ago in America with a young French pastor. We had simply asked ourselves what we wanted to do with our lives. And he said, I want to become a saint. This impressed me very much. Nevertheless, I, agreed, I disagreed with him saying something like, I just want to learn how to have faith. For a long time, I did not understand the depth of the antithesis. I thought I could learn to have faith by living something like a saintly life. Later on, I discovered, and I'm still discovering to this day, that one only learns to have faith by living in the full this-worldliness of life. Then one takes seriously no longer one's own suffering, but rather the suffering of God in this world. <clears throat> and then one stays awake with Christ in Gethsemane. How should one become arrogant over successes or shaken by one's failures when one shares in God's suffering in the life of this world? You will understand what I mean, even when I put it so briefly. I'm grateful that I've been allowed this insight, and I know that it's only on this path that I have finally taken that I was able to learn this. So I'm thinking gratefully and with peace of mind about the past as well as about present things. Dietrich Bonhoeffer arrived at that conclusion at the end of a brief life filled with twists and turns. From all these things, his experiences in the United States, the battles within the confessing church, the ecumenical circles, the resistance circles, his engagement and reflections on issues of racism, pacifism, what it means to have faith, all those things shaped his journey. And I think this led him from his early criticism and opposition to National Socialism to a much deeper solidarity and break with all that he had known, leading ultimately to the concentration camp in Flussenburg, where he was murdered in April of 1945. So what is a hero? A better question, I think, might be, what factors, external and internal, determine the, the path of a good person in evil times? The answer to that question lies not, I think, in looking for heroes today or in history, but in really reflecting on the nature of evil times and how it impacts those who must live through them. Understanding the ease and, and seductiveness of complicity, recognizing how difficult it is to step out of the evil around us. I worked for more than 10 years as one of the general editors of the translation of Bonhoeffer's works into English. And one of the most striking experiences for me in doing that was to read page by page paragraph by paragraph, uh, to discover a life so close up, day by day, doubt by doubt, um, at a moment where he didn't understand himself what was going on around him, and get a deeper sense of what it must have meant to go through his times as he did. And it's understanding Bonhoeffer from that perspective, I think, as a man confronting the evil of his times, and who has left behind um, 17 volumes of writings, uh, but what those comprise are 12 years of his life, uh, day by day, blow by blow, um, a documentation really of what <coughs> it means to live that way. And it may be an important exercise for us, it certainly has been for me, as we look at what is happening around us and reflect on what it means to be a person of conscience uh, trying to fight against evil. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>